I've completed the draft of a book. And, uh, and hopefully it will be in, in press before, with, without too many more for passing months. Uh, it will be in print. Because, and I'm excited about this because, I'm, and, and really it's written to try to explain, and you'll, you will see a lot of reference to Feldenkrais strategies. I commonly don't refer to them as Feldenkrais strategies, but you'll, it will be very familiar to you. And I want you to know that I'm, I am I'm, I, mean, I am strongly influenced, or put it another way, my evolution of my own thinking about this is very consistent with how you think about things. I have almost no conflicts, right? It's the difference between thinking about recovering uh, movement or recovering anything by pounding on it in a stereotypic way, thinking I have to get the, the person to be able to go from here to here, right? To think about that's what the goal is. The goal is much more interesting than that. And it's more about, you know, it's more about actually using a body and using variety to get there in all kinds of, you know, all kinds of natural exploratory ways. I mean, that's really what it's about. And uh, so I, this is expressed complexly and elaborately in this book. I hope, I hope in an understandable way to the average citizen. And I've also have written basically a second book because what I've done is written a book that I, I hope an informed layperson can read. And then I've written uh, on a website, I've written a sort of annotated volume in which uh, I don't have the, the text in the same elaborate way, but I have arguments about where the, uh, or explanations about where the arguments come from. And there I do refer quite a bit to uh, things like Feldenkrais practices. Uh, because I think that uh, I do want to keep people to understand that this is a place where they can get help. One of the lessons of this research is that stereotypy is the enemy, and that you really want to, you really want to exercise the brain with a variety of movement, with a variety of action, with a variety of challenge in the challenge that are presented to the brain. And this is one of the principles that comes down from this line of thought, uh, from, from the understanding that the feelings, the thoughts about movement are inseparable from the movement itself. But it's better to try to move to a point in space if you were trying to achieve some movement control at a hundred different speeds or in a hundred different ways to get to the point in space than to move, you know, that, that 200 ways in exactly the same way, you know. I mean, richer to, to basically to try to form that operation in all of these elaborations. And we're trying increasingly to build this into all of the cognitive training and exercises that we do. Because we know that that's really what the brain wants. What the brain wants is to be able to set up the conditions by which in a sense, it can solve the task in almost any circumstance, in almost any moment. From one point of view, the brain learns the rule. It learns what the relationships are. Uh, you, could, you could say the apply the factors that apply to re relate to performing the correct behavior under any circumstance, getting the right answer under any circumstance. But the other part of it is, is that it, the brain is learning more facilely to get there, you could say, from any direction. Mm -hmm. And that's really what you want. That represents a, a, an aspect of brain power. It's to be able to get there from all kinds of directions. And in, in a sense, that's the essence of how you grow a brain that's imaginative. Or the way I, way I commonly describe it to people is, is that when you get you know, older, it's common that an older individual will stereotype their movement. And it's a consequence of stereotyping, let's say they're walking. They're actually, they're actually less safe because, of course, safety in walking has to do with dealing with the surprise. And the surprise can come in all kinds of forms and all kinds of directions. And the only way you can really deal with a surprise that comes from any direction, basically, is to walk with substantial variability. And the same with thought. The same in your operations in general. You know, you basically want to enrich them, elaborate them, because basically that, that contributes to your uh, not straight lacing yourself in the point of view of how you're operating in thought, just like how you're operating in the control of your physical actions. So in, in a sense, the, the richer, the more variably you can move across these landscapes, the more powerful you are, and the more imaginative you are, and the more fun you're having. Another thing that we're always trying to control is to try to focus the attention, you could say, on the and, and have people really think about, in a sense, feel themselves in the action. In that case, commonly, it's a cognitive action. But we're trying to control that. We're trying to ba basically engage the individual in the task at hand in some relatively direct and controlled way. And we know from a rich variety of experiments, you know, my phrase for it is, the brain only changes, in a sense, when it matters to it. 
and matters to it means it has to be engaged on the task. In a sense, it has to understand what it's up to and it has to matter to it. And what that's really reflecting is the fact that under the right contingent conditions, it's releasing the neuromodulators that are actually controlling the brain change. And of course, it, it would not be so foolish or waste, wasteful as to permit change uh, when it has not itself determined that it's going to matter to it, that in the sense that it's going to benefit it. The witnessing the progression of change is a, a critical part of improvement. There are also really nice studies on motivation that have shown that when you believe that it's possible to change, when you actually believe, and this is something that in your instructive methods you emphasize, you know, you can basically, you are witnessing the change, and in a sense you're conferring and reassuring that to the individual that's in, in action with you. And so quite rapidly, the person understands that they have the capacity to change. I mean, they begin to feel it, they begin to sense it, right? And that's a critical aspect of it. It's a critical part of, and when we talk about motivation and contributing to change, we're really talking about neurology. We're really talking about things changing in the brain that condition the brain basically to change. And it's been shown that this is a critical and important dimension of it that you can have people be unaware of the possibility of change or aware of it, and the more in a sense they're aware of it and aware of the fact that they have the real potential to be different tomorrow as compared to today. Uh, the more they believe that, the more they understand that that's real, actually the more they change. This is another thing I like about what you do, because you understand that when you, when you witness movement, commonly the movement is distorted or incomplete. Now, what I understand from my science to some extent is where that does come from. And, and another way to put it is, is that commonly, well, first of all, you can drive change, of course, in all kinds of directions that are less than ideal. And they can be developed in an individual as habits. And that can occur, of course, in the domain of thought. It can occur in the domain of action. So that when you look at someone in front of you, you can look at a person whose movements are very constrained or are very limited or are very distorted. It might be as a consequence of something pathological that's happened to them or with them, but it might all just come out of, in a sense, a progression of habits that ultimately have led them in a not very productive or not very useful direction. So that the understanding that every movement, every place you get, is not necessarily the best platform for the next movement or recovery, but understand in some more fundamental sense, you have to recover to a more elemental position to get past this class of distortion that's so limiting to a person. And this is something I think that you have a better perspective about than do most people that are involved in movement therapy because in a sense you accept and deal with those, those distortions by exploring the possibility of correction and emphasizing the fact that you have to think about movement maybe in a way they haven't thought about it more completely in a more unified way that involves more generously involves the more natural aspects of movement uh, power and movement control. So I really like that about what you guys do. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's a, it was, uh, it's, there was wisdom involved in the genesis of these basic ideas from Feldenkrais and from the other early progenitors of this, of this approach.